is something most of us take for granted. Yet, it is perhaps the biggest crisis the world faces today. Half the world's population is already struggling with water scarcity. One third does not have water it can safely drink. And in the 15 seconds it takes for me to complete this sentence, one child somewhere in the world would have died because of a water-related disease. The crisis is not just about not having enough water to drink. It's about not being able to grow food, make clothes, homes, cars, computers, medicines. Water makes life, livelihoods, and lifestyles possible. Without water, we lose it all. It's also about peace and harmony. 12 out of the 17 most water-stressed nations in the world are also those with ongoing political tensions. Water scarcity is, in fact, expected to become a leading cause of global political conflict. Given how central water is to everything, you would expect everyone to be very concerned about its sustainability. Sadly, that's not true. For most of us, water is just something that comes out of a faucet. We do not know and do not care where that water actually comes from. And so, because we're so dissociated from the source, when toxic foam starts to float on a river, or when the well or the lake dry up, we do not get frightened. We think all we need to do is to dig the well a little deeper, or to pull water from further upstream. In our minds, the limiting factor is money, not water. And so what follows is an assumption that water is a problem of poor people, poor nations. The rich will not suffer. That's not true anymore. In the interconnected world we live in today, global warming, rising and spreading populations, and international trade are making water everyone's problem. Global powerhouses like California, London, Melbourne, Tokyo, Beijing, are all struggling with water shortages. Cape Town, the economic and wealthy economic powerhouse of South Africa, was in the news all through 2018 for its desperate fight to save itself from day zero. That was a day it was expected to run out of water. In my own home country, India, day zero may well happen in 21 of our biggest cities as early as this year or the next. Ensuring adequate water of appropriate quality to everyone, everywhere, and for every use is a challenge we will all face. The good news is we need not suffer. The solutions are already there with us. I live in Delhi. We're a city about the size of Chicago, but with 10 times the population. Our primary source of water is the perennial uh, glacier-fed river Yamuna. Uh, it is historically one of the largest in the subcontinent. Yet, as soon as the Yamuna enters Delhi, it dies. Every drop of water is taken out by the water utility to quench the thirst of the city. Sadly, uh, despite the river's supreme sacrifice, that water is just not enough. And so people dig wells and extract water ruthlessly for hours on end to bridge that gap. The result, we have a dead river. Now we also have dying groundwater. About 15 years back, I shifted to the house I live in now. It was a very nice, but a parched neighborhood. About 75% of us had fancy faucets in our homes, but no water in those faucets, and that included me. We were forced to depend on uh, saline groundwater from a public well. For fresh water, we called for tankers. Uh, these are like oil tankers, except that they carry water. Because water was so scarce, uh, fights over water were an everyday affair. At that time, I was also a member of our residents' welfare committee, and so I was called on frequently to make peace in these fights. What I found was that every person I spoke to 
thought that he was the victim and everybody else guilty of denying him water that was rightfully his. And because everyone felt victimized, nobody worked for solutions. All I ever heard was, this is so wrong, why doesn't someone do something? That experience changed me. The futility of this wait for someone to do something, the tragedy of watching good people spew venom, and my own struggles with trying to manage daily routines without water taught me just how much this formless fluid actually rules our lives. And that is why I started my work for water security. Surprisingly, my biggest challenge was not the know-how. It was how to get people involved in this mission. My first campaign was called the Jal Bhima Abhiyan. Translated, that means water security campaign. Its objective was to make people adopt rainwater harvesting as a means to water security. So every weekend, I would organize uh, public meetings in localities where I would invite the residents, the welfare committee members, the public utility officials, and the local politicians. And then through the week, I would handhold anyone who wanted to design or construct a rainwater harvesting structure. That campaign was a huge success. And I was very surprised with the response. I had certainly not expected the utility officials and the politicians to turn up for every single program. The fact that they sacrificed weekend hours for my programs, I thought, was proof of their commitment to the cause of water. I realized just how wrong I was when after one super successful program, the young politician comes running up to me, very excited, and he says, Madam, thank you so much. Because of your programs, these people are coming out of their homes to listen to me, to talk to me. My face is in the newspapers every week. Your Jal Bhima Abhiyan has made me a star politician. Thank you. <laughs> I was heartbroken. And Many more heartbreaks followed when I realized that much of the enthusiasm that I saw came from reasons that had nothing to do with water. It took me a while, but then I figured that whatever be the initial reasons why people adopted water conservation, once they got rewarded for it, they started to take interest in it, talk more about it, do more for it. They became ambassadors of the cause that made them stars. It was actually a win-win. Now this was my Buddha moment. It was a very liberating lesson. It made everyone, including you, potential water guardians. All I needed to do now was to find a reason that mattered to them. So today, when I talk to a farmer, I do not tell him, save water. I tell him, save your crops from water if you want to make profits. You save on pesticide and weedicide costs when you irrigate less. And when that farmer sees that logic and goes on to make a profit, he becomes a local hero, and everyone follows his example. Similarly, with rainwater harvesting, I found that not more than one in eight actually does rainwater harvesting because of his concern for water. Most do it for other reasons, like they don't want their houses to get flooded in the rains, or because of a legal compliance, or because they just want recognition. The way I see it is, the reasons don't matter. What matters is that precious rainwater gets saved and stored safely in the ground beneath our feet. We all become water secure. Working for water has taught me that a big problem does not necessarily need a big solution. Most often, solutions lie in small efforts being made by a lot of people. That is essentially what happened in Cape Town's fight against day zero. The government made some efforts. It ramped up the prices of water. It banned non-essential bulk uses of water, like swimming pools. And it tweaked the pressure in pipelines so that it was able to save about 10% of water in its distribution. But the battle was actually won by the people 
of Cape Town with their small collective efforts, like less toilet flushing, <laughs> two-minute showers, um, dirty shirt competitions in offices, and other such uh, efforts, small efforts. Together, they were able to push day zero back to the rainy season. With the rains, the dam levels rose, and the battle against day zero was won. The Cape Town success story holds another very important lesson. When the town realized it had no option but to make do with the little water that was left, they actually found ways to manage. Essentially, they made a paradigm shift from planning for demand satisfaction to planning for self-sufficiency. I believe this Gandhian approach to self-sufficiency planning may well be the trigger we need to innovate for a water-secure world. Over the years, as I've worked for water, I have seen water in its many forms and moods. And I've come to see it not just as a, as a life-giving resource, but also as a teacher. I can best explain this through an experience I had when I was visiting my ancestral home uh, in a village in the Himalayas. There's a small stream that flows close to my home. I love wading into the stream and sitting on a big rock in the middle of that stream. On this visit, as I was sitting there and just watching the water flow by, I, for the first time, I actually saw water for what it actually is a determined life force that never, ever gives up on its goals. That stream had obstructions, rocks, of all shapes and sizes, yet none of them were able to stop water's relentless flow forward. It just found a way to flow over, under, or around each of those obstructions. Water is a life giver. It is also a guide and philosopher. I believe we can overcome the water crisis or any other problem that life throws our way if our strategies are guided by the strength, wisdom, resolve, and adaptability of water. I think uh, Bruce Lee expresses this very powerfully in his famous quote, water can flow or creep or drip or crash. Be water, my friend. Be water. Thank you.